Okay, my friends, this is from a channel called What If? And they say, what if we discovered life on Mars? Well, I've been looking at the things that are on Mars, and I have been also looking at the things that are on the Earth. Neither of those things are, are, are understood in, in the kind of detail that I understand them in. I discovered mud fossils. I did the research on them. I am the one that they should be coming to to understand what they're looking at. They will never understand what they're looking at. They're trying to find bacteria when they're looking at chunks of bodies. I just did the video on this. It seems a certain life existed on Mars. There's the Mars crab. There's the Mars Morris code. It is saturated with blood on Mars. All right, there's the Mars crab. It's an arterial network with supplying blood to all of these sarcomeres, which are blood vessels, uh, uh, muscle tissue. This red, which is the red planet, is nothing more than blood cells and plasma eroded. This uh, this has to be looked at in a whole in new way. These are the Mars blueberries. They are nothing more than interstitial balls, which are these little black balls that are inside of all of the fleshy stuff. They erode into mud and the balls, because the balls are the tough spots. Uh, I showed all this stuff, and now that's the, that's what it is on Mars. That's the interstitial. That right there is what is on your skin. It pulls this way or pulls this way and so forth. You get the big long straps come out, you see? And the balls, everything erodes except the balls because they're tough as hell. And you end up with this. The skin is gathered here and pulled here. The, the things that are on the Earth and Mars and everywhere just absolutely enormous. I, I, you know, they said there was battles in the heavens. I don't know. But I can tell you one thing. There is so much life going on. And this is all backed up by, this was Comet 67P, 100% organic. I've been following this stuff better than NASA. They just they dismiss anything they don't want to hear. So it's time for them to talk to Roger. All right, now I run Mud Fossil University. I discovered mud fossils. I've investigated for 10 years. I know all about them. I've done the DNA on them. I've had it done, CAT scans, chemistry, anatomists. No question what I'm saying is correct. And if they will engage, we can get somewhere about what they're doing on Mars. As it is, what they want to do is to tell the students how to preserve rocks and the samples so that they can test them to see if there's any DNA. Well. They're swabbing the outside surface. I go deep inside into the arteries because these rocks will have arteries in them. This is what they have no clue about. They think it's just dead rocks laying around doing nothing. No, these rocks are from life. Okay, my friends, this is going to be fun. I have a fabulous friend who worked with NASA, the European Space Agency, all those people, as an outside contractor. So he was privy to all kinds of stuff. And we talk about all kinds of things. Nothing, you know, nothing uh, against security, but I found out a lot of things that very few people know. And in addition to that, the things that I discovered put together with that just blows things out of the water. Now, they're talking about NASA Perseverance rover and what they're finding on the landing and so forth, and I have a lot to add. All right, there's a rover up on Mars. Here's what they're looking at right there is something very similar to this. I believe this is a piece of, of well, these are pieces of lung tissue, I believe. And this is a lung, and there is the red blood that is still inside the lung, and they will be deep inside these pockets as well. That's why this is the red planet, is because the red blood, and I'm going to show you it in a microscope, you'll see it, no question whatsoever what I'm saying is correct. This is a lung, and this is what happens to them when they dry out in certain conditions. And this is what the condition this was in. This is the same as the condition that's just in. Now, if we can figure out what those conditions are, we get a little closer. But I have them that didn't dry out in those conditions like this as a head of a bone. These are what's called mud fossils. I'm going to explain it to you. I've done, t done this for 10 years. I know exactly what I'm talking about. And I have DNA certified specimens that are from giant humans from Earth. I'll show you. And I've been showing them for years, and it's been ignored and denied because it's just too spectacular. Well, I'm going to show you this in a microscope, and you'll see that there's blood inside here. So when they say about preserving them so they can wipe the surface and see if there's any microbes, who cares about that? Let's get some blood cells. 
Okay, my friends, I'm going to show you the results of the DNA testing I had. I believe, as far as I know, I was the first one in the world to have it done, and I had it done correctly. It took, well, three months or so, from 7-1-15 to 9-17-15. I sent the samples off on 6-20-15, and it, this is what was done. Three samples, DNA extraction, PCR DNA sequencing, and analysis. Now, I'm not going to show the the certified lab that did it because they're they were attacked for doing it really now the objective of the analysis is to perform extraction of genomic and or mitochondrial DNA from three mud fossil samples upon successful DNA extraction from the samples subsequent analysis will include amplification of that extracted DNA using these PCR techniques targeting specific DNA marker sequences to obtain DNA sequence from these amplified PCR products. Now, these were the three I sent. I am the one that took them. I'm going to show you exactly how I did it. I did it with a pin drill, totally clean circumstances, gloves, mask, da 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 washed everything and extracted it from deep inside of an arterial network. That's why it was dense, and he said, wow, it was dense for ancient DNA. All right, here's the bottom line. Following the processing and format, formatting of those DNA sequences that they extracted, approximately 80 to 100 base pairs of DNA sequence generated from the 36-inch tip using these A1 and 4F primers, and for the lung sample using the A1 and 4F were submitted individually into a nucleotide blast search using the National Center for Biotechnology Information Database. Each DNA sequence was matched to all DNA sequences contained in that DNA sequence database. They call it a BLAST. And they were Homo sapiens mitochondrial cytochrome B and D-loop region. Just what it was. Now, if anyone wants to test them, fine, test them. They say, oh, you're going to have to do two tests and six of this and seven of that. This stuff is sitting right here. And this is one of them right here. That's a giant fingertip. This is another one. This is a lung. That lung was done. I'm going to show you. I'm going to extract some more DNA, and I'll show you. It's red blood. I'll show you how I did it before. And the other one is a giant fingertip. Like this, only it was three feet long. One fingertip. This one's just a puppy, and this is about seven or eight inches long. All DNA certified human. Okay, before we go to Mars, this is on Earth. This fingertip is almost three feet long. It's on my property, and this is only one of many giants I have here. I broke this piece off here. This is the fingernail. Take your time and look at it. This is the blood supply that feeds up underneath the finger tip and the fingernail. This is the tip of the bone that bumps up against the next bone in your finger. Well, I, this is a thumb, I believe. Now, this is the fingerprints that wrap around the other side, and uh, uh, this is the thickness of what they call the grip skin. And underneath here, there's all kinds of little holes and where the, the blood supply came out. Very little blood feeds the fingertips. Uh, but we'll be able to see it. And this right here, uh, where is it right here? This is where the fingernail wrapped right around, and I broke it off. And that's the fingerprints. That's the grip skin. So this, and it's, this has been DNA certified too, 100%. And they said that they, it was dense DNA. Okay, I either have or will show you the um, actual lab report. I'm not going to say who the lab was. they fabulous. And it, uh, this is the discussion I had with them as it was preliminary just before I got the report. This was in August of 2015. And uh, this is my old channel, Mud Space Fossils. I had to abandon that um, for a variety of reasons. <laughs> Uh, all right, now here's what I'm just going to play from this point here where it gets sort of interesting. Here it goes. And this is the lab director, and he did the three samples in, in their lab. Very nice job. Real good guy, top shelf, and being attacked for doing it. Here it goes. A, a monkey or a primate. I mean, it's a primate, but 
how refined right, it is. Right, exactly. Yeah, on the database, it's showing, you know, for that region of sequence that I obtained for these fragments, you know, that they match up with, you know, 100% identity to, you know, the human mitochondrial genome, again, the D-loop, but I, I believe the other region was cytochrome B. I'm not 100% sure. I'd have to double-check my notes, but I know the one was the D-loop region. He, he's was correct it, was there both. a substantial amount of DNA? I mean, was it some, something that you pretty much certain it wasn't contamination or something? That's my point. Yeah, you know, I've, I've run the negative controls all along, and I haven't had anything... Uh, you know, the, the idea with negative controls is you want those to always just be blank, you know, to see nothing in there. And so the, the negative controls have, uh, you know, not shown any amplification, so, which, which is, again, what you want. So, uh, you know, i you know, confident that what we're seeing is, you know, not any type of contamination from, you know, handling or, or anything like that. So, um, you know, the amount of DNA that was in the extractions, too, was, for ancient DNA, it was, it was relatively substantial. So, you know, I, I, again, I, I don't think that there was any kind of contamination with anything. All right, see that? That's, that's the lab report. Okay, I'm just going to show you this in detail. But I had the other, I had three things done total. This was one of them from a hand, and I have the full hand and knuckles and all kinds of things from this one. Um, and this is the finger, this is this in a CAT scan. You can see the actual fingernail where it was, and I will show you a little great, better detail in the CAT scan. This is the surface scan, which brings out a lot of detail. Now, it's about seven inches, a little more, seven, seven and a half inches from front to back, tip to tip. Now, of course, there would have been more flesh to it when it was in its normal configuration there. Um, I have a apical tuft, which is this right here, from one that was more eroded. But the apical tuft sits right at the very end of the fingertip of humans, well, on all creatures that have apical tufts. And humans have the biggest apical tuft of any creature, even gorillas. <laughs> I don't know why, but just a little trivia there. Now, you can see that you don't really see a whole lot. It looks like a big chunk of mud. But once you see it in a CAT scan, whole different story. Let's look deeper. All right, here's that apical tuft that I talked about. And all of these little tip, tip balls have, these little balls go in them. That's the one still stuck there. And then the straps come down, and that will let you to do all the little things with your fingers. You know, because otherwise the bone couldn't move around. That gives you, I guess that, that's why we have such a large apical tuft. It gives us a lot more mobility, sensitivity, and so forth. Now that again, that's the CAT scan of this finger. And again, you don't see a whole lot when you look at it here, but you can actually see the fingernail where it was. And these, this, you see this? Tendons lock right in here. You just all kinds of, of um, anatomy here. That, and that's the uh, apical tuft area right there. And then you see different chemistry. You see the different colors? I don't know if you'll be able to see it in there. But you see this or orangey looking color? There's some kind of a fiber that is sticking into that exact spot. And the same thing up here and over here and over here and over here. These have something to do with tendon emplacements. There's, there's a lot of chemistry to look at in here to understand. And now watch, I'm going to go a little further. And where do you see, well, hold on. Okay, you can see the back of this bone. You don't see hardly anything. But when you look at it here, you can see the tendons here. You see it? And one of them's blackish and one of them's whitish. That's because they're arteries and veins. One side does the arteries and one side does the veins. And um, I removed this piece to look in to see what the, or, you know, the, um, tendon was like and uh, you know it's it's uh, very interesting to be able to do anything I want with this stuff because I own it it's on my own property I don't nobody's going to be able to tell me what I can and can't do and there's the the, the holes you see a little vein and artery that would be the vein the dark I believe and that's the artery now in the CAT scan might be different I don't know 
Oh, let me see. I think there's a little more here. All right, yeah. Now, this was the same fingertip looking down like this way. You see the holes that, that go down? The, those are the blood vessels. That's just, they're the main blood vessels that service this. And uh, I don't know if there's anything else here of any value. Oh, okay. This is another shot. Uh, here. Okay. This is another fingertip from the same hand. I'll show you the hand. And there's the vein in the artery. And there's the distal phalanges. They call that a bone black pattern. And that's where the apical tuft would have sat. And it, that one there is extremely eroded. And, um, but it is from the same hand. Um, oh, I don't know where it is, but let me show you the hand. All right, whoops, let me focus that better. All right, this is the hand in its entirety. Same as your hand, you have a bumper that runs around here, a pad of fleshy reddish stuff. And then down here you have the grip skin, the real tough stuff where you have all your, that's why it's peeling up here and it's silvery, it's got a lot of silicon in it and I think there's a lot of iridium in there too, I'm not certain about that um, I didn't do any chemistry on this but I, I know enough to understand the red oxides and so forth now, and that is a hand, it's a hand so, and they, these all these other parts came right, over, right, right off of the other parts of it and a knuckle and everything else, I got a knuckle over here, hold on there was there were spots that were very eroded, as you can see, and spots that weren't. That side of the knuckle ball is completely eroded away, and all that is is a knuckle ball. And this side still has the flesh on it. See, the fabric. You see the ball? The ball is right there, and that's still got the the fabric on there, which is the muscle. This right here is the tendon, and they had abrupt transitions. That would have run down somewhere to a side of the finger or something where it's coming up this way I'm not certain which way but that's a, that's a finger eroded away to almost nothing you see that once you take out these mud fossils out of the ground you're gonna find that inside they leak out blood into these holes because those holes were originally passages for blood and when you look at them in a microscope, you see them is absolutely flawlessly perfect. That is just blood. You cannot find a rock that you can't get blood out of. <laughs> There's no such thing as not getting blood out of a rock. And a lot of them are just virtually meat. They're still almost in the state of meat. When that came out of the ground, that, you could have put that on a plate and somebody would have tried to cut it. I'm not kidding you. It was that perfect. I'll show you. That's what a fascia latch is. They, you, the fascia coats an organ, and then the organ invests itself into the rest of the body with a latch. See this? That's the latch. That's the latch on my mud fossil rock here, this rock. All right? So, you know, they get brown as they sit around and lay around. But when they first come out of the ground, some of them, they, they just blood gushes out of them. Now, it's time for NASA and all of the institutions to talk to me. I am ahead of every single one of them. Not a, one of them can stand in front of me and, and say, oh, you're wrong, Roger. Not a single one. They just run and hide. I think that's disgraceful. And it's time to stop. I've been doing this for 10 years. Five years I've had the DNA and tests and casting. And Yale refuses. Harvard refuses. Johns Hopkins refuses. University of Texas sent police and lawyers against us because I wanted to ask them one question. This is just disgraceful. I'm sorry I have to keep going down this road, but I can't get off that road until they get off their freaking high horses and start paying attention. All it is to them now is a way to make money and to t suck it out of you. Because we are the ones that are paying them to walk in circles. All right, have a nice day. All right, and I contacted everybody at NASA that's involved. I mean literally everybody. The key objective is per Perseverance, is mission on Mars, is astrobiology, is what's, what's out there in life. I know what's out there already. I've known it for years, and they should know it, and any sighted human being should understand this. So I sent them, and this is not the first time, I sent to all of these people at NASA, all of these people and all of the ones that I could find at NASA, and let's see what they say. I don't know what they'll say, nothing, because it never has said anything. 